Welcome back to our series on statistical methods. My name is Mark Ledbetter, and we are going to talk about random effects one-way ANOVA in this video. So we're starting off with the RMD file that's provided for you on Moodle. And again, you can change um, this, the title, to whatever problem it is that you're doing for homework, or if it's the project, uh, you can change it for there. Change the author to you, and of course the date. And then do not change anything here in the output. You see these three dashed lines. You again do not want to change any of this, or you might not be able to knit the document. Uh, the other thing that you can do now here in the global settings, you can comment out this um, call that allows you to, um, uh, so there's a word that uh, got changed uh, when I did a auto replace. Um, it can be commented out as, um, maybe commented out as you like, okay, if you wish. So um, it may cause your um, our studio to run too slow. So if it does, then just put a pound sign in front of this and don't don't worry about it. Um, this gets everything out of your global environment. You can see over here I've run this already, and to get rid of it, um, this line will remove everything from here. Okay. And then here's a trick: Control L or Command L will remove everything out of the console. So this is handy when you're restarting uh, something and you want to see that. Then we have do not change or mess with this knitter um, right here. Please don't mess with that. If you do, then uh, it can have some messy effects on you. Okay? Echo equals true, uh, message equals false, and warning equals false keeps a whole lot of stuff from showing up. If you're having trouble and you want to debug, change these to true, or it's better really to, to put them down here as true. See, um, here I have include equals false for this, and what that means is I don't want the output to be included. I do want echo equal true for this. I want this to show up in the knitted document, but I don't want to see all of the um, output. So let's run these first uh, two chunks. So when I run the first one, oh, it didn't do it. Usually it will minimize the console, so I'll have to unminimize that. So that's the first one. And then the second one, look at all the stuff that, oh, well, this is not the first time. I haven't closed out. Um, R since I ran it the last time, but usually there's a lot of um, stuff that shows up that says um, uh, this is masked by such and such, and this is masked by such and such. So we've got two new um, libraries down here, so you may have to do an install on these um, packages, okay? And therefore, they are random effects ANOVA, both of them. All right. And again, please don't mess with this or else it will really cause you some issues when you try to make it a, a PDF, knit to a PDF. Okay, so we have the loom example from the book, and it's a random effects model. So a textile company weaves fabric on a large number of looms. It would like the looms to be homogenous so that it obtains a fa fabric of uniform strength regardless of which loom the fabrics um, produced on. So the process engineer suspects that in addition to the usual variation in strength within samples of fabric from the same loom, there may also be significant variations in uh, strength between looms. Now if I put a asterisk on one asterisk on either side of a word, that makes it italic when we knit. If I put two, it makes it bold. So this is bold. I don't want this to be bold. Do you see how it turned to a darker blue? I want it to be italicized. Okay, so just one. To investigate this further, she selects four looms at random. And that makes the, the factor loom a random effect. Okay. Now, right now, uh, in this video, we're only talking a one-way ANOVA, so we only have one factor to consider. As soon as we go to two-way ANOVAs, we can mix fixed factors with random factors, and we often do. So it's very important to understand which factors, if any, are random. 
uh, factors or random effects, okay? Because we can't do some of the things that we did in the fixed effects model. Like for a random effects model, we don't care about contrast because the contrast would be between the specific looms chosen, and those are those are of no importance in this case. The particular looms chosen have no special significance. They are just four randomly selected looms out of a large number of looms in this plant, okay? And so for each of these looms, they take four strength determinations. It says the experiment is run in random order. If, if it's not run in random order, the results aren't meaningful. And I will tell you from personal experience that um, upper level um, managers who don't understand statistics, they don't understand the reason that this needs to be random. Because I'll tell you, it takes a lot more effort to actually run these um, test randomly. So you go to one loom, you ran a, run a sample, and you take the measurements, and then you stop and you go to another loom. That's not very efficient. They'll want to run everything from one loom altogether, and you cannot do that. Okay? You cannot do that or else you have violated the assumption of independence. You say, well, how is that? How are they now dependent? Because you've got, you probably have the same operator um, operating that machine, and then the machine warms up, and then the machine, uh, so it, it, it varies more when it's cold, maybe, and then it uh, warms up, and maybe it stabilizes more. So the longer you run it, the better, the, or the more consistent it may be. So, um, what you would want to do is if you need that loom to, uh, to all the components to warm up and you know it takes uh, 20 minutes, then you would have to run that machine for 20 minutes before you took your sample. And then you'd have to shut it down, go to another loom, uh, possibly, depending on the random order, go to another loom, shut it, turn it on, warm it up, then take a sample, then maybe shut it down and go to another one. So um, now if all the looms are running, all day, then this becomes easy. You go to one loom, you take a sample. Um, maybe you randomize when you do this. So um, you say, okay, I'm going to do all of these as close as possible to each other, but I'm going to take one from this one, then walk right over, take a reading from this one, and so forth. And you keep going in that random order to get, and um, that might be better. Okay, so there's a lot of ways to make this less onerous for the um, for the people who have to worry about the cost. Okay, but again, this random order is really important in these experiments. So then we have one way, and I say balanced. It's still balanced uh, for all the treatments. Yes, and it's a random effects model. So the first column is the random order. I created that. We weren't given this by the author, so we're just told it was in random order. So I generated these random numbers, 1 to 16, and then typed them in as an extra column. The next one is the loom. And so the way these are organized, is that right? No, it's the observation. So the way they're organized, it was like you went to the first loom, second loom, third loom, fourth loom, back to the first then the second, third, fourth, then back to the first, second, third, fourth, back to the first, and that would not be a random order, okay? Um, <clears throat> so we wouldn't want to try to say that that was the random order, and that's why I've done uh, giving you this. In real life, obviously, you'd need to know the order, and then it be randomized, and then you could do this. I had to change my columns to four because I have four columns, order, then observation, so this is for each loom. Here's the first observation for the first loom, second observation for the second loom, um, or, or yeah, second observations for that first loom, third observation for the first loom, and then the fourth um, observation for that first loom. Okay, so that's how those numbers work. We've had to make this um, a factor for um, Y0 and Y1 uh, for the um, ANOVA, it needs to be a factor, and for Levine's test, it needs to be a factor, so we can use either one of these. Uh, Y2, I have selected the columns, 2, 3, and 4. I will always, for Y2, uh, get rid of the observation. I don't want to plot the, uh, uh, the order, I'm sorry, I get rid of the order. I don't want to plot the order uh, variable because uh, that's just messy. Okay, so I get rid of it for that, but I have it for the others in case I need to sort, and, and that's what I do. Y1, I sort it by the order. 
I do not do that for y2 or y0. All right. <clears throat> and then we uh, figure out capital N, little n, uh, A, you have to type in manually. There's four treatments or looms here. And then we print out our table. So let's run this chunk. We get our table. I've just called it fabric strength observation loom and strength and it looks nice. Okay? I could sort this by loom and then by observation number and um, that would be fine as well. So it's really just a personal preference there. So we want to do the descriptive statistics. Again, if a homework problem doesn't ask for this, you don't have to do this. You can just delete this section. Um, if you're doing a project, you will want to do everything that's in this file. Okay, and the or I've tried to put it in the right order for you now so that you're not having to rearrange things. Uh, if you're doing homework, you may have to rearrange things based on the order in which the question's asked. Okay, so, the, so when I run this, um, I can look at the medians, and what I see is that, remember, that going from one, two, three to four loom, that order is meaningless. These are randomly selected looms, so in this case, it's not like the fixed effects where we had um, some type of uh, power level so that the increase in power level was meaningful. Here, the increase in loom number is just random. So what all we're looking for is the range of these medians, and it looks like the minimum is 91.5, the maximum 97.5. Interestingly, um, the mean is identical for these, okay? which from first glance would suggest to me that they are, that they are symmetric. And then we see that 95 is the median, or I'm sorry, 95.5 is the median for the third loom, and 95.75, it's still pretty close. Um, but it's going to be at least slightly skewed. And then we have 97 and 97. So the medians, so we can see, we can get an indication that there may be um, some symmetry here. But we won't mention it now. We'll do a box plot to check that. And then we have the standard deviations going from uh, 0.96, let's say, to 1.83. So we have means and medians going from 91.5 to 97.5. And so that's what I've put up here. The mean and median range, uh, median strength range from 91.5 to 97.5. If they were different, you'd have to break these out separately and talk about them. And then the standard deviations range from 0.96 to 1.83. Okay. So you have to give some type of analysis of the descriptive statistics if you're going to include them. Now, um, I've used dot plots. I probably wouldn't use dot plots for this. I'd probably delete that part and just use the box plots, but um, our book uses um, dot plots or strip charts. And uh, so here is uh, what it looks like. And so you can see higher, lower, higher, higher. Okay, so um, interesting that we only seem to have three observations from the third one. Let's look and see in our data. So I've, I, it says n equals 4 for all of these. Okay. So maybe we have some observations from loom 3 that are identical. So um, here, let's see, observation loom 3, we have 96. Oops. And then we have 99. Okay, so loom Loom 3, we have 96, we have 95, we have 97, and we have 95. So we have two 95 values for Loom 3. And so we're only seeing three dots uh, for that here. And that's why, because 95, this lower value, is being repeated twice and we can't see it. And it doesn't give us any indication that there's duplicates. So, But we see that there looks to be some difference in the... Uh, location of these. Again, the biggest difference between the first and the second loom. All right, so now we can, uh, so with this, um, okay, so I didn't change this, okay, from last time. So I need to um, say pretty much um, that um, <clears throat> the dot plots show that the um, strength uh, 
is somewhat different based on the loom selected. Okay? And that's all you really have to say for this. You can't say much more except that they're different and we can't talk about the order across one to four because again they're randomly selected um, so that, that's not important. Now we take a look at the box plots and the box plot here has, um, you can now see the medians, that's the bold line here, and you can see the difference in the medians, so that is what we are going to um, talk about. Uh, the box plots show that the variations in, show the variations in the medians and the IQR, which is the box height. You can see that they're different, especially number three, it seems different than these. Now look at the symmetry. Uh, one, two, and four appear symmetric, while number three appears skewed to the right. And did I say that? Um, yeah, so the third loom has a skewed, right skewed distribution. The remaining three have approximately symmetric distributions. And if you remember when we looked at the medians and the means, that for one, uh, two, and four, they were very close to each other. Three was slightly different. Okay. Now we're going to do the random effects one way ANOVA. So we need to write our hypothesis test. So the first thing is that sigma tau squared is equal to zero. Remember, we cannot talk about the effects or the means for a random effects model. We can only talk about the variance of the treatment effects, okay? Versus the alternative that it's not equal to zero. And we have to put at alpha equals 0.05 or whatever the uh, specified alpha level is in the model. And so we have the model and we instead of the means uh, model, we write the effects model. And this is the way you should write it for a random effects model because we're going to talk about um, sigma tau squared. So we need to have a tau somewhere in the model to talk about. Okay. And when we did a fixed effects model, I like to use the means model because we we're talking about the mean of the ith treatment for the fixed effects. And so we should have that in the model so that it makes sense. And then we have i is 1 to 4, and j happens to be 1 to 4 as well, uh, the number of observations within each. Then we have the assumption that the tau i are normally I, uh, independently distributed, uh, 0, uh, sigma tau squared uh, variance. And then we put the uh, uh, distribution, the normally um, independently distributed uh, epsilons mean zero variance sigma squared. So we run this. Now I, we're going to run the regular ANOVA first. And this is how we perform the test. And we can see that the p-value is pretty small. Um, I'd round that to 0 0.0002, okay? So I never go more than four decimal places with the p-value. It's just kind of bad form. So uh, we want to look professional, so we, we uh, do that. So we put the test statistic as 15.68, uh, which is the f-value, with 3 and 12 degrees of freedom. Here's 3, here's 12, corresponding to a p-value of approximately 0 0.0002. We reject H0 because 0 0.0002 is less than alpha, which is 0 0.05. There exists sufficient evidence to support the claim that the looms in the plant vary significantly in fabric strength at 95% uh, confidence level using n equals 4 observations per randomly selected loom. So I'm emphasizing that this is a randomly selected loom. Okay, so. Uh, there's our ANOVA table, so if it asks you for an ANOVA table, this is what you do. But we need to take into effect account the randomness, and this is not uh, looking really at, um, if we want estimates, we, we can't, we can use this with the method of moments estimator, um, but let's, let's take a look at, at this. And so this is our, we're using Lemur, Elmer, I don't know if you say Lemur, Ellen, um, LMAR, but it's a new um, package that we haven't used before. And we have strength as our Y, and then we have the tilde, and then we have in parentheses one given loom. And so this one means it's a random effect. Uh, 
per loom, okay, conditioned on the loom. The data is Y1, and we used our aim, the restricted maximum likelihood is true. And this will help us with some estimates, give us accurate estimates. If we say false, then we get um, a maximum likelihood estimators instead of the uh, method of moments uh, and the uh, they won't agree. So here they agree. Then we run the summary uh, of that as well. And it gives, so what we get is we have, let's look at the output here. First thing is it's a linear mixed model fit by RMEL. Now it's not really mixed, it's random because we only have one um, factor and it's random, okay? A random model, but they always say mixed model here because you can use this for that. The t-test used Satterthwaite's method, um, and so that means that we'd have the Satterthwaite's uh, degrees of freedom calculated, okay? And the formula, here's the uh, formula that we used, and here's the data set. Then it gives us the, the REM, the restricted maximum likelihood criterion converged at 63.2, okay? We have our residuals, the min, one, uh, Q1, median, Q3, and max, in case we're interested. And then we have something called random effects, and this is for the treatment effect. They call it the intercept, and that's deceptive for us, for us, but it is for the loom, for the random effect of the loom. And then we have the residual or error. So this is an estimate of sigma tau squared, and this is an estimate of sigma squared. Now, this standard deviation literally is the square root of the variance, all right? Um, but we're not going to use that. We're going to use this. And we want to calculate um, confidence intervals for these, okay? So here's the fixed effect. It says intercept. This is the overall mean here. And here's the estimate of it. And um, we want to know whether it is uh, different than zero. That's what the test is. And it's saying it's certainly... Uh, different than zero. Okay. So let's do the parameter estimates. So the first one is um, sigma tau squared. Now our book tells us how to calculate this. We could use the ANOVA method. So we could use this ANOVA table and take MSTRT, which is um, this 29.729, minus the mean square error, which is 1.896, and divide by N. So, now remember, if it's unbalanced, we have to change n to another value, the n naught, and it's a calculation that we have to do. I've put those in the notes so that you could do that, okay? I have not programmed that into um, this uh, R, because we would probably do that calculation manually, and it would be a lot easier than trying to program it in R every time, okay? And so, this estimate gives us 6.958 as a uh, sigma uh, tau squared hat, okay? Remember, we can get the estimate for sigma tau squared, uh, but we cannot do the count confidence interval. It doesn't have a closed form. So then, now let's look at what we had um, here. Right here is sigma tau hat squared, 6.958. It agrees perfectly with our estimate there. Now, um, the MSE is the, um, is the estimate is sigma hat squared, 1.896. Here's the estimate right here. It also is up here in our table, 1.896. All right. So what we want to do is, um, let's see, so we have that, and then we want our uh, total variance. So remember, they're independent. If we want an estimate of the total variance of y sub ij, then we add these two variances, and it's 8.854. Now, Remember that the proportion or intra-class correlation coefficient is the vari proportion of variation between the looms out of the total. And I need to take this there, okay. You can't have any spaces between the dollar signs and the text or else it won't. It will create an error when you knit. It won't do what it's supposed to there, okay. I found that out the hard way. So this, this ratio here, sigma tau hat squared divided by sigma hat hat uh, sigma tau hat squared plus sigma squared. So this is the ratio we're looking for. And I have uh, plugged that in here. And uh, so we calculated that up above. Sigma tau hat was um, 6.958. 
the, uh, the sum was 8.854. And so here I have that plugged in. It gives me 78.6% or 0.786. And so that means that the proportion of total variation uh, attributed to the difference between the looms is 78.6%. 78 so that's, that's a large portion say a large portion of the of the total variation is attributed to the um, uh, difference between the looms. So in other words, um, uh, most of the variation is coming from the looms, not from random, uh, just random occurrence. So the estimate for uh, mu hat is y dot dot bar. You can get that by taking the mean of the strength or the y variable in the original data set, or you can pull it from right here. So under the fixed effects. So the fixed effects is just the mean. And then we have the information for a confidence interval if we want to do that. Okay. Uh, so this is the um, mu is an estimate of the expected fabric strength of a randomly selected loom, and it's randomly selected from the whole population of all looms. Okay. Now let's talk about the confidence intervals. To do this, um, we have to give our alpha, we have to plug that in, and it was much easier just to plug in the value of MSTRT, the mean square treatment. That's much easier than trying to do it in code. I couldn't actually, uh, without taking, you know, going into doing a lot of research, um, I couldn't figure out how to do it um, uh, easily in code. So we'll just type those in. It's easy enough, you know, to look back at your ANOVA table, MSTRT, right up here is 29.729. And I can actually put 2, 9. All right, instead of 3, 0. Okay. And then we have the MSE. Now, I can pull that from uh, the summary of the ANOVA one. And then I have calculated um, U1 and L1. And I, I call this chi for chi squared. Um, I want this chi squared for value for U1. If you remember our uh, confidence interval, it had... Um, MSTRT over MSE times 1 over F and then we had alpha over 2 and 1 minus alpha over 2 so uh, and and let's see I think they both had N minus A degrees of freedom okay so um, so we need the chi squared for these and then we can calculate this so I've, I've plugged in the um, uh, manually plugged in for 95% here because I've got 0.05. You'd have to change this. If you're doing a 99%, then you change uh, alpha to 0.01 and you change this to 99%. Okay, and so we run this, uh, and then I've got the confidence interval for sigma tau squared over sigma tau squared plus sigma squared, the interclass correlation coefficient, and I have the formula for L here and U here. Um, exactly the way that uh, you have it in the notes from last time. And then I'm uh, calculating these, and then I'm doing the uh, L over L plus 1 and U over U plus 1, right? Okay. And that gives us the proper um, confidence interval there. And then we do the confidence interval for uh, mu. So we've got mu L, the lower limit, and y dot r all is just y dot dot bar here. And uh, then I've got the t value. So I'm looking it up. And then the square root of MSTRT over, over capital N. And then we have the plus here. And because alpha is 0.05, we make this 95%. If, it was, if we change alpha, we need to change this. But this is pretty much takes care of itself, and it prints out all three for you with several decimal places, and you can round it as you need. I round it, I think, to three decimal places for everything. And I, if you're going to do a confidence interval, you have to interpret it, and here's the interpretation. We are, in this case, 95% confident that the interval from 0.975 to 5.166 contains the true value of sigma squared. Calculated using n equals 4 observations for a equals 4 randomly selected looms. I am emphasizing a random effect here. 
And we do the same thing for the interclass correlation coefficient. We're 95% confident that the interval between 0.385 and 0.982 contains a true value of the ratio, this ratio of, uh, of variances, calculated using, again, n equals 4 and a equals 4, uh, n equals 4 observations um, from a equals 4 randomly selected limbs. And finally, for mu, we have the interval here, and we do the same thing. So there's the confidence interval. And now, we can um, approximate the confidence intervals for tigma, sigma tau, not sigma tau squared, but sigma tau, and sigma and mu. But we're going to get different values here because we're using the restricted maximum likelihood, or REML, um, method here. And so there's a numerical uh, calculation. So it's a numerical analysis of this. And so here it's a very simple uh, piece of code, um, and it gives us the three. And so this is sigma tau, not sigma tau squared, just sigma tau. You notice it says SD for standard deviation, and this just says sigma, not sigma tau. And this is the intercept, which is mu, the overall mean. And so I've put these into the um, into this and. Here we say we have, uh, contains the true value 0.967 to 2.184 for, um, I say ratio, there's no ratio, for sigma, okay? Uh, and I've squared each of the values, and so this corresponds directly to the one above, 0 0.936 and 4770. 936 and 4770 versus this. So it shifted down, okay, for this one. And this is for sigma. Now we can't compare this one. This is a ratio. And down here we don't have a ratio. This is just the second one. Oops. The second one is just the confidence interval for sigma tau. Okay. And so 1.129 to 5.749. But when I square these, look how big this interval gets. So we can get an interval for this, but it's not very useful. It goes all the way from 1.275 to 33.05. That's huge. Okay. So it's a 95% confidence interval. And even though we can get it this way, that doesn't, and it's for sigma tau squared, we can't um, get a good one. So it's better not to use this, all right? I've put it in here, um, but if you, if you want to use it, then you have to do the analysis. If you don't want to use it, you can just select this all the way down to here and delete, okay? And just remove it from the model. I suggest you do that uh, unless the question specifically asks for these uh, confidence intervals, okay? And then we want to verify the model assumptions. We've done this before. I have put this in the order that we should probably do it. First is normality. If you check this and then you have to run a um, the variance equal, equality of variance test, Levine's test, then you need to know that you have normality before you do that or else your test is meaningless. Okay? So the Q, so let's look at the QQ plots. I have, uh, this isn't, I have commented this, I have not included this one. This is the alternate method um, that I don't like, there's no confidence band. So we're going to skip this one, and we're going to use the method that uh, is going to show up. You can just delete this if you want. Uh, I put it in there because, you know, there may be a time when you don't want the confidence bands for some reason. Um, but uh, we'll run this chunk of code, and we get two plots. So for normality here, we have two things we need to check. The normality of the random effects, you'll notice you have one for each loom and then the normality of the residuals. Okay. And this number here, this um, first one value is really close to the confidence band. Um, and they're wide because we have only four values. And then we have the confidence uh, bands, 95% confidence bands for the residuals, and those are all within, but you'll note that this value here and this value here are are near the middle of the distribution and they're not that close to the line. So those are concerning too. They're going to make a formal test have a lower p-value. So, um, but we can see 
that by looking at this that we would be very comfortable saying that we agree with the assumption of normality for the residuals and here we can say that we're uh, okay not really comfortable but or confident but we're okay with the assumption it's not so bad that we can't use the results okay remember that um, the uh, ANOVA is uh, uh, well, this is a random effect. It's not as robust against uh, departures from normality. So um, here's the analysis. I'll let you read that. I won't read through it for you, okay, because we've done it before. And then um, here are the official normality tests. If you do official normality tests, then you, if you show these result, results right now, they're not showing anywhere, okay? And if you run this, it's not going to show anything or output. But if you do run, do if, if you take the echo equals false and the include equals false off and use this, then you have to write the hypothesis, like we do for every hypothesis test. Okay, which I have not included that verbiage, but you can get it uh, from uh, something else, copy and paste, and just modify. Okay, so here's the uh, normality test. If I just run the code without running the chunk, then uh, Actually, I can select both of them and run, and I'll get both. So the first one is for the random effects. Okay? And as we suspected, it's only about 0.2, and that's because this point is right there on the line, and there's only four points. Uh, for the residuals, it's well, it's even over, over 0.5 for the p-value, so that's great. Okay? So if we were to reject normality, 54% of the time we'd be wrong. Here, we'd only be wrong about 20% of the time if we rejected normality. Then we need to look at the equality of variances. We know that it's normal, so if we need to run Levine's test, we can. But we should only run Levine's test as a last resort. So let's look at, um, okay, so this is um, one that I have um, the first chart. I, this was uh, online. I found this. It's a Tukey-Anscombe plot. But it's almost identical, identical to what we get. It's the only one that the um, random effects gives you for some reason, but you need more than this. So, um, so instead of using it, I'm using what we did before, the plot ANOVA. Now the comma one does the first plot. I also have an alternate uh, thing down here that will give us a, uh, so I'm going to run the chunk, and then we look at this and you say, well, okay, I've got the three values here. Remember, one of these is duplicate, and it's the same y value for the that, so that's why we're only seeing three instead of four, and so that makes it look like it has a smaller variance. But we can change our perspective by changing, oops, by changing the, um, I don't need that last one. If I run these two things here, I've changed the, um, residual values on the y scale from uh, here we have uh, negative two and a half to positive two and a half. I'm changing it to t negative 10 to 10. And that gives you, by zooming out a little bit, we can now see if there's a big difference between these. And there doesn't look to be such a big difference between them. Okay. And so I'm saying this line in the middle is straight. I don't see a funneling effect. It's not small getting bigger or big getting smaller. Um, this variation is, yes, it looks smaller than the rest, but it's not a, a lot less, okay? It's not like so noticeably smaller that we'd say, ooh, there's a problem there, okay? It's getting close, but it's not there. And you might need to run Levine's test to get a better feel for that. But again, if you do that, then you have to write out the hypothesis test for it. Okay, so um, here's the first plot, and again, it looks pretty good. And then here's the second, the uh, second plot, or actually it's the third one. Now I've I've plotted this ab line at one because the the chart doesn't give it. It gives this line, which is like the the mean uh, or median for each of these. I, I forget which. And it's supposed to be a line at one. Now just looking at the red line by itself, you may think it's jumping all over the place. But look at the scale, 0.8, and so. It's a little below one here. It goes slightly lower here. And then it goes just a little bit above here and a little bit below here. It really is kind of bouncing around this line at one. So even though it's not a straight line, it's not bad. 
okay? And I don't see a funneling effect, and I don't see um, one, uh, one of these that's very, very different from the others. This scale makes it a lot easier to see that these are, um, yes, this is a little bit smaller, um, but this one's not much different, and this one's not much different, and this one now is a little bit bigger rather than smaller. Okay, so together, I'd say we don't have any issues. Again, uh, I've, I've made this so that this doesn't show up by default. Uh, if you're going to use it, you have to write the hypothesis statements and uh, analysis. But you'll see that it's a 0.3, basically a 0.33 for the p-value. So um, we didn't fail the uh, test for equal variances here. All right. But, uh, and so that's what I've basically put here. You're welcome to read this. I'm not going to read it to you, and the video will make this a little uh, faster than that, hopefully. So with this, we, we don't feel like there's any violation of the assumption of um, normality nor of equal variances. Now we need to look at independence. Um, and so let's take a look at this plot. I have one, then I have two, then I have two, then I have one, then I have two, then I have four, then I have one, then I have one, then two. I don't see runs of four everywhere, or five, uh, like we did in the other example, uh, just um, or one example that we, we looked at. I only see a four here, that's the max, and on the negative side I've got a couple of twos, uh, three of them, one, two, three. That's not significantly uh, those are not significant runs that, that show anything about uh, or that Im indicate a positive correlation. So I say there are no runs of positive and negative residuals to indicate a positive correlation. The largest run is of four points on the positive side and only two points maximum on the negative. The assumption of independence is not violated. Okay. So I hope this uh, helps you uh, look at this chart in a, a good way. Now, linearity. So this is a way that we can check linearity. What I want to point out is I could put a straight line through this group of four, the straight line where it is, and if I look at these lines up here, I'd put a straight line through them. So I could put three parallel straight lines, but what I'm seeing is a linear type of trend. So I don't have any curvature to show me that it's quadratic. I don't have any cubic or anything else. I don't have a, a square root kind of, uh, you know, that comes up and then, then uh, uh, tapers off. It increases sharply and then tapers off and becomes flat. That's like a square root or an exponential type of uh, uh, plot. I don't see any of that. Okay. So this looks like uh, we do have a good linear fit. And so there's no obvious departure for lin linearity. We finished checking everything we need to check for the assumptions. Hence, taken together, the assumptions of the model do not appear to be violated. Okay? And that is the end of our analysis. All right, I hope this helps you with the uh, homework and the project. So please take care of yourself. Stay safe because we want to see you next time.